In 1948, a psychologist named B.F. Skinner locked a pigeon in a box. Inside that box was a lever. When the pigeon pressed the lever, food appeared. Simple. Predictable. The pigeon pressed the lever when it was hungry. Then it stopped, but then Skinner changed the rules. He made the food appear randomly. Sometimes the lever gave food. Sometimes it didn't. The pigeon pressed the lever constantly, obsessively, compulsively. Even when it wasn't hungry, even when the food stopped coming entirely, the pigeon had been hacked. A pigeon in a Skinner box, frantically pressing a lever. This is not a metaphor. This is the exact mechanism now running inside your brain. Deep in your midbrain sits a cluster of neurons called the ventral tegmental area, the VTA. This is your dopamine factory. Dopamine is not pleasure. It is anticipation. It fires when you expect a reward, not when you receive it. Your ancestors needed this system to survive. It drove them to hunt, to explore, to seek mates. The uncertainty of success kept them alert, motivated, alive. But evolution never prepared your brain for what happened next. A smartphone screen. Thumb pulls down. The loading icon spins. Then, notifications appear. In 2009, a designer at Twitter named Lauren Brichter created the pull to refresh gesture. He based it on slot machines. The pull, the anticipation, the variable reward. Sometimes you get nothing. Sometimes you get a like, a message, a piece of gossip, outrage, validation. You never know. And that uncertainty is the point. Split screen. Left, a gambler pulling a slot machine lever. Right, a teenager refreshing TikTok. Their brain scans show identical neural activation patterns. Your VTA cannot tell the difference between hunting for food on the savanna and hunting for notifications on a screen. The dopamine fires. You feel the urge. You check. Sometimes you win. Mostly you don't. But the not knowing keeps you coming back. This is called a variable ratio reinforcement schedule. It is the most addictive pattern in behavioral psychology. And every app you use is built on it. Lines of code scrolling. Then, a neural network visualization pulsing with data. But the variable reward is just the hook. The real weapon is the algorithm. YouTube's recommendation engine doesn't show you what you want. It doesn't show you what's true. It shows you what keeps you watching. Inside YouTube's headquarters, engineers staring at dashboards filled with metrics. Watch time, click-through rate, session duration. Guillaume Chazlot was one of those engineers. He helped build YouTube's AI, and he watched it learn. The algorithm discovered something the engineers didn't program. Conspiracy theories, outrage, and extremism keep people watching longer than truth. Not because people are stupid, because human brains are wired to prioritize threat detection over accuracy. The algorithm doesn't care why you watch, it only cares that you watch. A flowchart showing the recommendation pipeline. Input, user data. Output, optimized content. Feedback loop. Watch time increases, algorithm reinforces pattern. Every second you spend on the platform, the algorithm learns. What you click when you're bored, what you watch when you're angry, what you share when you're lonely, what you almost click but don't. It maps your desire, not who you are, who you could become if pushed in the right direction, and then it pushes. Stock ticker, numbers rising. Then, Meta's quarterly earnings report. Meta makes approximately $60 per year from your attention. That's the market rate for your consciousness. But the math is more disturbing than it looks. Breakdown of time spent on platform versus revenue generated. The average user spends two and a half hours per day on Meta's platforms. That's 912 hours per year. $60 divided by 912 hours equals six and a half cents per hour. Your attention, your life, is being monetized at six and a half cents per hour. Less than a sweatshop, less than prison labor, and you do it voluntarily. Let that sink in. But Meta isn't selling your time. It's selling access to your behavior. Advertisers don't pay to show you ads. They pay for the probability that you'll click, buy, believe. And that probability increases the better the algorithm knows you. Real-time ad auction interface. Bids flying in. Winner takes users' attention. Every time you open the app, you are the product being auctioned in real time to the highest bidder. Your emotions, your insecurities, your political beliefs, your purchasing intent. All of it cataloged, predicted, and sold. This is not a conspiracy. This is the business model. Tristan Harris, former Google design ethicist, speaking. 
Tristan Harris calls it the race to the bottom of the brainstem. Tech companies compete to exploit your most primitive impulses. Fear, outrage, envy, lust, not because they're evil, because the incentive structure rewards it. Graph showing user engagement versus content type. Outrage and fear dominate. Facebook's own internal research, leaked in 2021, revealed that their algorithm amplifies divisive content because divisive content generates more engagement. They knew this, they measured it, they continued anyway, because changing it would reduce profits. Mark Zuckerberg testifying before Congress. His words are empty platitudes. The stock price remains unchanged. The system is not broken. It is functioning exactly as designed. Your addiction is not a bug. It is the core feature. Brain scan time lapse. Months pass. The prefrontal cortex shrinks. The amygdala enlarges. Your brain is not fixed. It is plastic. Every experience reshapes it. Every habit carves neural pathways. And the habits you practice most become who you are. A woman, mid-twenties, waking up. First action. Reach for phone. Check Instagram. Scroll. Scroll. 30 minutes pass. Meet Sarah. She's 26. She checks her phone 96 times per day. She doesn't know this number because she's never counted. But her phone knows. She used to read novels. She used to paint. She used to have conversations that lasted hours. Now she can't focus on a book for more than 10 minutes. Her hands itch for the phone. Her mind wanders to what she might be missing. This is not a personality flaw. This is neurological restructuring. Left, Sarah's brain five years ago. Right, Sarah's brain today. Studies from Stanford and UCLA found that heavy social media users show reduced gray matter in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, the region responsible for decision-making, impulse control, and long-term planning. Meanwhile, the amygdala, the brain's fear and emotion center, shows heightened activity. Sarah's brain has been optimized for reaction, not reflection, for stimulation, not contemplation. She has been rewired. Sarah trying to work, opens laptop, writes one sentence, checks phone, returns to laptop, reads email, checks phone, repeat. The average knowledge worker switches tasks every three minutes. Every switch carries a cognitive cost. Your brain doesn't instantly shift gears. It takes 15 to 20 minutes to reach deep focus after an interruption. But the interruptions never stop. Graph showing productivity loss from task switching. The area under the curve represents wasted cognitive capacity. Cal Newport calls this the context switching penalty. You are not multitasking. You are rapidly sequential tasking. And your brain is bleeding efficiency with every switch. But the deeper damage is structural. Pathways for deep focus atrophy. Pathways for rapid attention shifting strengthen. Your brain builds infrastructure for the tasks you practice. If you practice shallow work, you become excellent at shallow work. If you practice distraction, you become excellent at distraction. And you become incapable of depth. Sarah used to write poetry. Now she can't finish a poem because her brain has been trained on 15-second TikToks. The infrastructure for sustained thought has been demolished. A teenage boy scrolling through Instagram. Photos of friends at parties, exotic vacations, perfect bodies. You open Instagram because you want connection. What you get is simulated connection. Likes are not relationships, followers are not friends, comments are not conversations, but your brain doesn't fully know the difference. FMRI, scan showing reward activation from receiving a like versus an in-person compliment. They're similar, but not identical. The dopamine hit from a like activates similar pathways as genuine social bonding. Similar, but weaker and hollow. It's like drinking Diet Coke when you're dehydrated. It tastes like hydration, but it doesn't satisfy the need. So you keep drinking, the boy refreshing his post obsessively. 23 likes, refresh, 24 likes, refresh, 24 likes, disappointment. He wanted to feel valued. Instead, he feels measured. His worth is quantified in metrics. His identity is a performance. His relationships are an audience. The original desire to be known has been displaced by the desire to be seen. And being seen is not the same as being known. Connection arrow likes, knowledge, headlines, meaning, motivation quotes, adventure, travel vlogs, achievement, scrolling productivity porn, intimacy, parasocial relationships with influencers, 
every human need has been replaced with a cheaper, faster, emptier version. And the tragedy is this. After enough time consuming the substitute, you forget what the real thing feels like. You forget what it's like to sit with a friend in silence and feel connected. You forget what it's like to struggle with an idea until you understand it. You forget what it's like to create something that matters to no one but you. The substitute becomes the standard. And when someone offers you the real thing, it feels boring, too slow, too effortful, too uncertain. Your brain has been trained on junk food, and now vegetables taste like cardboard, a chessboard, pieces moving. Then the board catches fire. Just delete the apps. You've heard this advice, maybe you've tried it, and maybe you lasted a week. Then your friend invited you to an event via Facebook. Your job required you to network on LinkedIn. Your family group chat moved to WhatsApp, and you were back. Network effect diagram. One person leaves. The network remains. They return. This is not a failure of willpower. This is a structural trap. Individual choice cannot solve collective coordination problems. Social network graph. Billions of nodes connected. Facebook is not valuable because of its features. It's valuable because everyone you know is already there. This is called a network effect. The more users a platform has, the more valuable it becomes to each user, and the more costly it becomes to leave. Someone deleting Facebook. Their social graph fragments. Events are missed. Messages go unread. FOMO intensifies. You don't just delete Facebook. You delete access to parts of your life. This is not an accident. This is the moat that protects the platform from competition. They don't need to be the best. They just need to be where everyone already is. And leaving means losing connection itself. Protesters holding signs demanding tech regulation. Cut to lobbyists in Washington. Cut to congressional hearings where nothing changes. Even if a million people delete their accounts, the system doesn't change. Meta still has 2.9 billion users. YouTube still controls video. Google still owns search. Your individual defiance is noble and irrelevant. Political campaign contributions from tech companies, hundreds of millions of dollars. In 2022, tech companies spent over $70 million lobbying Congress. That buys a lot of inaction. The incentives are misaligned at every level. Politicians need campaign donations. Tech companies need user growth. Users need connection. No one wants the harm, but everyone's individual incentives produce the harm anyway. This is the tragedy of the commons, digitized. Timeline projecting forward. The metrics get worse. Screen time increases. Attention spans decrease. Mental health declines. Without intervention, the trend is clear. More extraction. More manipulation. More sophisticated behavioral control. AI doesn't need to become sentient to be dangerous. It already is dangerous. Not because it's conscious. Because it's optimized. Optimized for engagement. Optimized for profit optimized against human flourishing. A teenager staring at a screen, face illuminated, eyes empty. The AI alignment problem everyone fears in the future is already here. These algorithms are misaligned with your well-being, and they're getting better at manipulation every day. GPT-5 isn't the threat. The recommendation engine you've been feeding your attention to for 10 years is the threat, and it's already won. So what do you do? You can't fully escape. The infrastructure is too embedded. The network effects are too strong. But you can refuse to be a passive participant in your own consumption. Here's how. A phone in a drawer. A browser extension blocking infinite scroll. A timer on a website. Make it harder. Delete the apps. Use browser versions that are clunkier, slower, less satisfying. Install website blockers with timers. 20-minute access windows. No more. Put your phone in another room when you work. Make yourself physically walk to retrieve it. That 10 second walk gives your prefrontal cortex time to ask, do I actually need this or is this a compulsion? 90% of the time it's a compulsion. A phone screen converted to grayscale. The vibrant colors are gone. It looks medical, unpleasant. Enable grayscale mode. The colors are not neutral design. They are engineered to be irresistible. Remove the colors, remove part of the dopamine hook. Friction is your friend. The algorithm is optimized for frictionlessness. Every added second of effort is a defense. A person learning to play guitar, another person rock climbing, a woman in a pottery class. Your brain doesn't need TikTok. It needs novelty. It needs challenge. It needs reward. 
Give it better sources. Learn a physical skill. Your hands on an instrument, on a rock wall, on clay. The feedback is immediate, tactile, real. And it rewires your dopamine system back toward effort-based reward. Friends sitting around a table, laughing, no phones visible. Rebuild in-person social reinforcement. Schedule weekly gatherings with no devices, board games, cooking, conversation. Your brain will resist. It will tell you this is boring. That's withdrawal. Push through it. After three weeks, the craving weakens. After three months, the substitute starts to feel real again. Someone writing in a journal. Someone coding a project. Someone building furniture. The algorithm wants you to consume. Consumption is passive. Passive users are predictable. Predictable users are profitable. Creation is the opposite. When you write, you must think. When you code, you must problem solve. When you build, you must persist through failure. None of this is algorithmically optimizable. A completed project, a finished essay, a built bookshelf. And when you finish, the reward is yours. Not a like count, not a view metric, not external validation. You made something that did not exist, that rewires your brain back toward agency. Protesters demanding algorithmic transparency, lawmakers drafting bills, alternative platforms gaining users. Individual action is necessary but insufficient. Support regulation, age restrictions on addictive features, algorithmic transparency requirements, interoperability mandates so you're not locked into walled gardens. Fund and use alternative platforms, Mastodon, Blue Sky, anything not optimized for ad revenue. Make phone addiction socially unacceptable again. When someone pulls out their phone mid-conversation, name it. Hey, are we good? You seem distracted. Culture shifts when individuals enforce norms. A city at night, millions of glowing screens and windows. The hum continues. You will not escape entirely. The system is too large. The incentives are too entrenched. The convenience is too seductive. But you can manage your relationship with it. You can notice the urge before you act on it. You can choose friction over frictionlessness. You can create instead of consume. This will not be a viral video. It will not get millions of views. The algorithm will not promote it because it is against the algorithm's interest for you to hear this. But here is the last, most important thing. The system does not need your consent to control you, but it does need your attention. And attention, unlike most resources, is something you can choose to withdraw. Not perfectly, not completely, but enough. Enough to remember what it feels like to think, to focus, to be present in your own life. The world will keep humming. The screens will keep glowing. The machine will keep running. The only question that matters, will you be awake while it does?